Hey, welcome to that episode of the Dan Lok Show. Today, I am super excited. We are gonna have a lot of fun. I have a friend of mine here, local legend, local legend, entrepreneur, sophisticated professional investor. It's kind of an amazing story. We're gonna get into it. Also, author of the new book, Double Digits Return. Double Digits Return. So I'm so excited. We're gonna have a lot of fun and we're gonna dive into you. Because a lot of you, you're asking me how to make the money. Uh, once you make the money, now how do you multiply the money? Because most people don't know how to make money. Even if they don't know how to make money, they don't know how to keep the money and multiply the money. So Amel, right here, welcome to the show. Thank you, such a pleasure, thank you. Thank you, so Very great. share with us a little bit about your background, because you've got an amazing background as well, right? They started with nothing, and how did you get into like what you do today? Well, I got into investing uh, in a very serendipitous way. Yes. I was taking a small business, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship program in, yes. in the college, and uh, part of the curriculum was putting together a business plan. Mm. And the business plan was reviewed by a couple of guys, mm. uh, two CAs, accountants. Mm. Yes. And uh, when they reviewed it, they, they said, Arnold, this is wonderful, but where do you get the money for the business? So, oh, well, you know, I just assumed that would happen. <laughs> for Didn't think about that, but okay. <laughs> academic purposes. Yes. And they said, hey, you know what? You gotta smell the coffee, and you're gonna you, you, you need money to make money. Yes. And uh, then one of them pipes up and says, you know what, a guy like you should be either in used car sales or the biggest stockbroker. So I uh, chose the stockbroker part mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, got a job. I, you know, I looked around and uh, the job that I, got, that I got was actually as a messenger. I got a, mm -hmm. uh, a clerk, clerkship in the mailroom of a brokerage firm. So I started off uh, wow. at the very bottom of the totem pole. Yes. And in my quest to become a stockbroker, I applied, yes. starting with the firm I worked at. Everybody said, no, too young, no money, no contacts. Don't know what to do. Don't know what to do, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Mm. And I applied everywhere, at my firm, at the bluest of the blue chip firms at the mm. time, yeah. the grubby, grubby, dingy bucket shops, and everyone said, no, 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 no. So what did I do? I phoned. The fellow that said, hey, you should get into the brokerage business. I said, sir, I'm having an issue here. What, get do, you, on a job. Yeah. what do you recommend? And he says, well, listen, get a really good high quality paper stock, put, put together a resume, and I'll make a couple phone calls. Oh, nice. So somehow he got this door open for me that uh, went into a lavish office. Not as lavish as your home here, let me tell you. Not, <laughs> not that uh, beautiful, but he got me an interview with the then CEO of a, a mid-size uh, firm, and, and I was hired. Mm. And I said, this is fantastic, who do I work for? Mm. He says, no, no, you want to work for yourself. So mm. I became a stockbroker at age, uh, gosh, 20, 21. Oh, wow. You know, that's yeah. and, and at that time, uh, what, in the beginning, what was it like? Because you probably didn't have any sales background, anything like that. Like, what? I'm sure the struggle, that's right. Dan, I had nothing, nothing. <laughs> the Dow was at 850, interest rates at 15%, wow. and it was tough. Most people were at the at the coffee shop or at the bar, mm. and I was uh, on the phones, mm. and uh, I didn't know any better. Yes. All I knew was to work. Yes. And dial for dollars. Yes. And it was it was, it was not easy. I can tell you that. And like I said, as you know, I teach closing and sales. In during that time when you were, were dialing for dollars, what are some of the lessons you have learned? that would be applicable to any entrepreneurs in terms of sales and closing? Dan, excellent question. I looked around the firm. Who are the biggest producers? How do I learn from them? Nice. nice. No, there's two ways to learn, right? Yeah. You can learn through your own years of hard work, trials and tribulations. Hard knocks. Shit. Hard knocks, and believe you me, I've had plenty. Yes. Or you can learn from somebody else's hard knocks. Yes. Trust me, you still have to work hard. Yes. But it's easy to learn from someone else. And I, learn from other people and um, one weekend, this is an amazing story, true story in fact, uh, and not very many people believe me, but there was a magazine on my desk, I was in my office on a weekend, and the magazine had the face of someone that had won recognition in the business. Oh. And in his rookie year, he made $3 million. Wow. Yeah, I'm talking in the early 80s. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Still a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And the magazine article, in his first year, rookie broker, three million. Second year, seven million. Mm. So I thought, you know, if I'm gonna learn from somebody, that's so someone is doing it right. That's the guy. Yeah. So I, I cold called him. Mm. 
column A. Yes. Column A. <laughs> it took a long time to get through the defenses. Yeah. And finally, I don't know if it was Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon, I, I was able to get a hold of him. Mm. And he says, sir, I, I said to him, sir, I'm, you know, I just started out. I'm a young guy. I have no experience. I'm in Vancouver. Mm. Uh, gosh, you know, if, if you could teach me even one or two things, I know it will transform my life, my mm. career. Mm. And he says to me, Hermel, listen, what are you doing next weekend? I says, well, you tell me what I'm doing next weekend. Yes. <laughs> he says, come to New York. <laughs> And that's exactly what I did. I oh, went to wow. New York City, and I still remember ordering a, 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 an orange juice. It was $10 back in those days. I'm telling you, expensive city. Yes. And I learned a lot from him. And the biggest thing I learned from him, you ask me what I learned in sales, mm -hmm. is to put your needs aside. Mm -hmm. You've got to address that person's needs first. Yes. And once you're able to put your selfish Aside. Nice aside. Yeah. Ask that individual, what's important to you? Do you want, is, you know, in the case of a car, you know, do you want a sports car? Do you, you, it's a family car, right? Exactly, yeah. and so on and so on. And, and uh, at the time, this guy was just killing it. He, uh, uh, you know, he had major corporations as clients. I think the president of the United States was a client of his. I mean, this is, this is a big time deal. So that was one of the most transformational uh, things I learned. And of course, you know, you, you normally learn from people. Like, I think I will learn lots from you, and I'm sure other people have learned lots. Yeah. And uh, I think you can also learn by reading. Yes. So I did a lot of reading then, and still do now. And uh, remember Zig Ziglar? Yes. Okay. Probably Tom. Okay. <laughs> Probably Tom. <laughs> uh, Tom Hopkins? Yeah, Tom Hopkins. Okay. Yeah. So yes. one Classic. house per day for a year. This guy is insane. Yes. And um, I read them all. Brian Tracy? Brian Tracy. Yes. Amazing. You know, he's a martial arts you know, uh, like yourself. And um, there's one guy that I came across that just, just changed the way I looked at everything. Mm -hmm. A guy named Earl Nettinger. Oh, yes. The Strangest Secret. Yes. Yes. And uh, what I got from him that I still get today, I still listen, I still have his tapes. In my the place. cassette tapes right back then? Absolutely. Yeah. I have my car. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, he follows his boxes. I remember those. I, I still have them. Yes, I have them. I have them as well. And uh, he said, you know what? Uh, um, the uh, law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And that's something that has never left my mind. It's what I've used to build my, my um, you know, when I'm down, down and out. I've been down and out many times. Yes. Uh, even when I'm enjoying some, some good times, you cannot forget about the law of cause and effect. And, in his world, he's, he, he taught people that, hey, you know what? You get what you give. Mm. Your rewards in life will always match your service. Yes. You can't sit in front of the fireplace yes. no. for heat. Yeah. No, you got to put the bloody wood in first. Yeah. And then you get it. Mm. what you want. Mm. So those are my early lessons. I, I love it. I love it. And it's, it's interesting you brought it up because it seems like to me that you had some good mentors in your life. Right? Same thing with me. You're like, okay. It's funny because I call my mentor, same thing. I call him 13 days straight, like consecutive every single day. Get there, no, 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 These guys no. are busy. <laughs> right? I, you know, I, keep, I kept calling him. So it's the same idea. What's interesting is, I think you brought up a good point. Most successful people, I'm sure you get that too, right? People approve or approach you, approach me. You don't want money, they want a job. Right? But very few people approach us with, I just want to learn. I don't want money from you. I don't want a job from you. Can I just learn from you? And believe in our successful people, most, not all, right? But most are generous. Because you remind them of, hey, you know, I was that young guy, right? Dan, it's really simple in life. You know, you get what you give. Yeah. And the more you share. And I love what you're doing. You know, you're sharing something that, that's more valuable than anything. Mm -hmm. You're sharing your knowledge, your experience. Right. You can't put a price on that. Yeah. And, and the I know, impact that you have on people. And I know what you've done for one individual that I that introduced us to. Yeah. His life, you know, I've known for a while. I've yeah. seen the transformation. So kudos to you. Appreciate it. Kudos. And, and I think it's like, the, the metaphor you saw at the time, it's like, like a candle that when you light up another candle, your light doesn't get diminished. It just it lights up more people, right? So exactly. if we can get to a place where we are, we on, are. On the way, successful. can I get my candle too? Yes, I'll give you a, a, a bunch. I'll give you a bunch. <laughs> so, so from stockbroker and from there, um, how, did you, how did you transition to now what you do commercial real estate? Oh, another family well, let's talk about what was my catalyst. Yes. Uh, being a stockbroker, I, listen, I hope you don't have many stockbrokers that are listening to the show because they might, they might 
<laughs> send me some hate mail. I found, when I was a broker, I, found, I felt very hypocritical. Uh, Just think about it. I'm 20, 21, 22. Mm. I had to grow a mustache to look older. Mm. My voice is still a little on the high side. I, you know, I had to talk really deep. And, <laughs> 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 and you know, here I am, yeah. broke, yes. taking the bus to work, yes. living at home, yes. and giving, telling. giving investment advice. Yes. Tell me about what, what about makes sense to It's true, it's true. Like a lot of soft brokers are broker than you are. It's very true. I say it all the time. Yeah. So I, I you know, I left I left the business actually to invest on my own. Mm. And that was just before the market crashed. Mm. Markets in 87, you might remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a tough time. It was and, a tough time. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, um, you know, I thought, you know, if I'm so good at giving investment advice, I should be taking my own. Mm. And eat your own cooking. Eat my own cooking. Now, let me tell you, my cooking was <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that good. <laughs> Many of my initial investments did poorly. Some actually even failed. Mm. I mean, I'm talking miserably. I, I went broke uh, three times. And uh, lucky for me, I, had a, I have a wonderful family. You know, they gave me the financial net to bounce back off of. Mm. And over time, I learned. I learned how to deploy capital much better. Mm. I learned uh, that I need people around me. You know, I, I know you have a phenomenal team because you were kind enough to introduce me to some of them before the yes. show. You have, you're yes. very lucky, you're a fortunate man. Thank you. So I surrounded myself with, with some good people and, you know, I, I was able to, to uh, deploy my capital in better ways. And um, for the longest time, I was trying to get the highest risk-adjusted returns that I could. Okay. But... Dan, uh, it's, it's, that's a tough thing to do. It's very tough. And if you do it consistently, it's even tougher. You've no doubt read uh, Tony Robbins' book. Yeah. Tony Robbins writes, I mean, it's a 400-page tome. I've read every page, every word. Yeah. And it's a sentence that stands out in my mind. And that sentence is, well, I'll say two, two or three sentences. He says, over any given 10-year period, 96% of all professional investors lose money. Yes. Don't beat the markets. Yes. 96%, Dan. Yeah. And he says, carries on, he says, over the next 10-year period, the 4% that made the money, we're not the same 4% in the next category, yeah. all right? So it's tough to make money, even if you're a professional. It's very, very good. And these are, like we're talking about sophisticated investors with the team, with, with, teams, with, with technology, with, exactly, with everything. Exactly. So um, I decided that I needed some, some diversity. I needed to augment my portfolio. I needed to get more cash flow. I needed less risk. I needed to get something more stable. Mm. Uh, so I chose commercial real estate. Mm. Why did you choose commercial real estate? Why not like residential? Like what, what, what we found in more appealing? Well, one of the first things that I, that I, uh, when I examined and compared one of my asset classes, you know, you forget about industrial, you forget yes. about warehousing, you forget about hotels. I mean, there's a whole slew of yeah. real estate that segments. You say no to, yeah. And I like commercial because, you know, in a building, you have multiple tenants. Yeah, so diversifying. Yeah. Those tenants, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in practice, what you want is you want to have multiple tenants with, with overlapping leases. So when one lease expires, the rest of the building keeps yes. supporting you and yes. so on and so on. Yes. And also long-term lease, right? Long-term leases. I like that. I like that. And uh, so you're looking for more stability, right? Got it. Correct. Got it. And, you know, lucky for me. I got into commercial real estate with no experience, mm -hmm. no knowledge, mm -hmm. no contacts. Mm -hmm. What was the first deal that you did? Like Dan, it wasn't too far away from here, actually. Okay. Yeah. It's a building. We're in one of the most beautiful yeah. places in Vancouver. Yes. I'll tell you, uh, I bought my first building in North Vancouver. Okay. Okay. And was it a con? Was it a? No, it was, it was a mixed use. Commercial building, okay. about forty-three thousand square feet, okay. on the corner okay. of this beautiful, busy. Okay. Uh, so with retail, retail, and then retail bottom, commercial, uh, a movie, movies, yeah. and then commercial at Got the top. It. Got it. And uh, and when I got there, understand, I didn't know anything about real estate. Mm. And the agent, the one agent that I was was helping me, he comes up, and he says, "Oh, Armel, I want you to meet this fellow." Well, who, who's this guy? <laughs> and he said, well, he does the sales. Well, what do you do? Yes. Well, Armel, I do, I do leasing. What? Am I going to pay double commissions? What the hell is this? <laughs> I thought you would help me with that. He says, no, no, there's one commission. So that's how ignorant I was. Yes. That's how... What, and how green. Green, green, green. Yes. 
How much was that property back then? Uh, it was it, nine and a half million dollars. Okay. okay. And so I said to him, I said, look, uh, here's how I want to be known from this moment forward. Mm. How I want myself and my team to be known mm. is uh, people that treat others with respect, with regard, mm. with courtesy, mm. with fairness. Fair so I said to these two agents, I said, make this wonderful man. He bought the, the lot, built the building, got it tenanted, and sadly his wife had passed away. Mm. So he was in that phase of life where he was selling his assets to cash up and got so on. So I said to them, we're going to treat everybody fairly. Yes. Not just our tenants, not just, I mean, I'm talking about everybody, our bankers, the guy that sweeps the floors and yeah. washes the windows, yeah. every, we're all the same. I love it. And I said, make this man an offer. I don't, I'm not here lowball, I'm not, not a nickel and dime, right? because that's disrespectful. Mm. Make him an offer that he cannot refuse. Mm. I love that. So he, they made him an offer and it's accepted on the spot. Wow. I'll tell you something else. You love this because I think this yes. is how you are. Yes. Met you and I admire you now instantly. Uh, you know, when you make a sale, it's a pretty good sale. Yeah. Uh, nine plus million dollars. And that's a pretty healthy commission check, I would yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's common to get a video commissions back at the dinner table. Yeah. <laughs> Where the agents take you out? Yes. Well, it happens a lot also in the <laughs> real estate. You know that, right? You all want to kick back and stuff like that, right? Well, when we had our celebratory dinner, mm. it was not me sitting at the head. Mm -hmm. It was the vendor of the property because wow. we were celebrating the sale because of him, not because I bought it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we built our business. And every asset after that, mm -hmm. we've had the same philosophy, being honest, transparent, genuine. If you were to go to my website, you're going to see something that is as rare as a four-leaf clover. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a little three and a half, four-minute video mm -hmm. of my tenants telling the world how wonderful their landlord is. But when's the last time <laughs> you saw that? Yes, yeah, true. Okay, I'm talking about Dozen or so tenants, yes. and I got testimonials. Yes, um, got, got tenants usually complain. <laughs> they, they bitch about the landlord, right? Uh, Dan, let me tell you, when I go to my properties, I'm like, I, you know, I feel like a, I feel like you. I feel like a movie star. They all want to sit I, down with me, yes. <laughs> have a cup of coffee or wine, whatever. Yes. You know, it's, when you treat people well, guess what? They're gonna treat you well too. You get yes. what you get. Remember, yes. you're you know. Yes, and if you think about it, really, the tenant, like I think a lot of landlords, they treat the tenants like they have this, like enemy relationship, like, oh, I'm the landlord, right? You're, the, you're just my, like, tenant. Versus the tenant is actually your customer. They are the one that's paying your mortgage, right? They, they are your customers. They want, they're the ones that kind of fills your wealth. Dan, I, I take it one step further. Mm. They're my friends. Mm. They're you, get my know, friends. You, get, you get to know them. And, and I'll tell you something shocking. I'm sorry to interrupt, I apologize. Yeah, no, I'll tell you something shocking. I'm probably the only guy that you know that has lower rents wow. of his tenants because I, I believe everything should be fair. Mm. So if an individual is paying above market rent, mm. how is that fair to him? Mm. It's not. Yes. Well, I've been known to lower rents. And by the way, I'm not interested in, in, in accepting below market rents either. So it has to be fair. It's fair. 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 Yeah. 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 fair. And my record, uh, I used to do leases the 15 minutes or so. And uh, recently I splashed, I, I have a seven minute, six minute record of doing a lease. Oh, wow. Why, you might ask. Well, I'll tell you why. When everything's fair, what is it they're talking about? Yeah. Nothing. Let's just do the deal. Sign here, let's go for a glass of wine. Yeah. End of story. Yes. I love that. And I think because I think for commercial, and not residential, a lot of commercial deals, they are more private deals, right? I think, I'm just guessing, once you, you have that reputation, now the sellers or the industry people know that you being a fair guy that attracts more of your flow. Versus if you know as a guy, who always low balls people. Who always like pushes people, who always not being fair. Yeah, you might win this one transaction, one deal, but no one wants to deal with you. No tenants want to deal with you. No sellers want to deal with you. But yet you do it the other way, right? Now it's 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 best that people come to you and say, hey, here's a deal. What, what do you think of this? Because we always know you're fair. Um, I'm so happy you said that. It's exactly right. It's exactly the reputation we've built over time. Yes. And we do, we see a lot of transactions that most people don't see. Yes. And for that same reason. Right. And also, they know you can close. I'll tell you a, a mm. funny story. Mm. Uh, so, you, that was my first building that I bought in North Vancouver. Yes. It was a second building. Yes. That I was bidding on. Yes. Um, on West Broadway. Okay. And so, I just bought one, one building. And this building was... Um, uh, un, 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 unpriced, so you have to compete, you have to bid. bid okay. 
And so I was one individual, everybody else was institutional. Mm -hmm. And so it's the strangest thing. So if you win the first round of bidding, you go to the second round of bidding and, yes. you, and you do a, a you know, playoffs, whatever it's called. Yeah. So I got into the second round of bidding yeah. and I was one out of 12 or 13 parties. Yeah. But I, I was the only individual. Everyone else is institutional. institutional. Got it. So, and as it turned out, I got the highest price. I bid the highest price by $200,000. Mm -hmm. It's 28 million something something. Yes. And the vendor did not want to sell to me. August. Why? Because they didn't think I could close. Uh, Understand all institutions yes. and some. They know they got money. They some that. some guy that's got no. Yeah. Yeah. Like you've done one deal. Like who the hell are you, right? So when you're an institutional investor, what are you doing? It's not your money. You're yeah. managing somebody else's cash. Yeah. So what you're really protecting is your job. Yes. And that the the vendor of the property was protecting his job. He was not doing what was best for the, the seller. Yes. He's trying to protect. I was the best thing for the seller because I would have given the best price. Right. Right. That makes sense. So, anyway, needless to say, needless to say they, uh, they, they, get, they show me all their, their properties now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, also a friendship. Indeed. Right? And, and I, I know that, like, the commercial real estate, I mean, that's a, that's a small circle. Well, you know, when I, when I lost that, that uh, opportunity to buy that property, there, another one came up in Gastown. Mm. I'm sure you know where Gastown yes. is. Back then it was, it was blight. It was... Uh, those drug dealers, drug those dealers. panhandlers. Yeah, was not, 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 not such a little sketchy. Yeah, it's sketchy. Uh, that was much better, though. Yeah, yeah, much, much better. But when I bought it, and I knew uh, for a whole slew of reasons that this was a, a great um, investment. And the same individual that did not want to sell me that original property of $28 million, yeah. they were selling this asset in Gastown. Right. So they had bought... A portfolio of properties, and I put a value of fifteen million on that gas town property. Mm. I paid them twenty. Mm. So uh, I gave them, and by the way, uh, a five million dollar lift in a year. Yeah. So of course now they're very happy to sell it to me. Yes. <laughs> Whether I could close or not is yes. irrelevant. Yes. Let's give the guy a chance. Yes. And I closed. Yes. And um, just FYI, that property now is worth five times more. Yes. Because gas town is transformed into it's like a two voice. Yeah. Oh, it's it's one of the most Stunning places in North America. Yeah, I mean, it's it just yeah. So it's got character. So, so from so in terms of commercial uh, real estate, what do you look for in, in a deal? Like the cash flow, the return. How did you do your due diligence? You know, I've got a number of parameters that I mm. that I've laid out in my in the book that I've yes. written. And one of the first of all, I don't take risk. Okay. Number one. Okay. Remember, I got into real estate. And yes. For less risk. Yes. So I don't do. Development. I don't do redevelopment. I don't do repositioning. I don't do any of the fancy things that people much smarter than I do. Yes. Because they're looking for an extra few bips on on the return. I don't do that. So I only go for high quality, mm. excellent properties, mm. good beautiful. location, good location. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, there's no adage location, location, location. Mm. Well, I don't. I don't believe in that. Mm. I believe in something more important, more powerful. Ask me. What is that? Timing, timing, timing. timing. I know you're going to say Yes. You know, you could have bought the best property in 2007. The worst time, yeah. And what, 18 months later, yeah. you're off 50 points? Yeah. By the way, today I just read, I think, by, uh, as of 2017, two thirds of all homes in the States have yet to reach their pre peak levels. Two thirds. Mm -hmm. So timing, timing, timing. Do you not just buy in, in Canada? Do you buy in the US? US as well. US as well. Yeah. And, and you might ask me, well, when is a good time to buy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> timing is most important. Why is it a good time to buy? It's a good time to buy when you get a great return. Mm. When you get six, so, seven percent on a beautiful, well located, excellent property, it's always a good time to buy. Yes, and a good tenant, perhaps. Uh, good multi tenants, absolutely. And uh, I will tell you something else. Uh, in addition to location, there's something else very, very important. And there's a few more, more mm. concepts that, that I'd love if we have more time to yes, go right. into. Um, People want to be in a building or in an area that has lots to do. Amenities. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. You know, when I come out of my building in, in downtown Vancouver, and by the way, I should tell you, when I when I was a messenger. Um, yeah, in the mailroom? Yeah. In the mailroom. I used to go all around the streets of Vancouver delivering mail. Yes. And uh, one of the buildings that I used to deliver to, I, I now own. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. In, in Vancouver. That is, I mean, it's, it's, that's you know, awesome. That's you know, a great story. And... Um, so, 
you know, when I come out of my building, I want to be able to walk across the street, have, have lunch, have a glass of wine, I want to walk over here, maybe have some great sushi or, mm-hmm. or some... Uh, or, it's a lifestyle. Right? It's a lifestyle, amenities. You want to, you know, I, I'm, and if I want to go home, I want to jump in. So, so it almost sounds to me that when you look at it, not just look at numbers and all that, it doesn't make sense, but it's like, would I want to live here? Exactly. Right? That would, would I want to please be in my home, right? Well, I like this neighborhood, it's nice. Like, yeah, I can see that. And naturally, other people, other tenants are like, yeah, I like this. This place too. When you have people, your traffic and retail, commercial, everything is everything's flourishing. Is that kind of absolutely? Dan, I know why you, you live here because you know just down the street is the ocean. Yeah. And you turn left, and there are all these beautiful shops and stores. Yeah. And just down the street, you've got one of the most beautiful malls in, in all of North America. Yeah. I, I know why you're living here. Yes. Uh, then that's you know. It's too much. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And everybody's the same. Makes yeah. sense. Absolutely. And so so now from there, so you 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 were doing your own investing, but you were using your own money, right? You were yes. using. Like you weren't raising capital or anything like that, right? No, correct. Uh, were you using a lot of leverage when you bought a property or just typical? Well, let's go back to one of my philosophies, yeah. low risk. Low risk. And what is risk? Debt. Debt. Right? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't use debt because yeah. debt is like salt. Yes. Just need you know, the right amount. Not too much. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, you need debt to, to you know, goose up your returns, of course, but too much debt is no good. And if you were to study the biggest failures in real estate, you will, you will note that most of the failures were because of over leverage. Over leverage, right? yeah. Right? I think Mr. Mr. Trump lost the plaza because he's over leverage. Over leverage. And just go down the you know, list of people who have failed. Mm. Too much debt. So, so what would be a good ratio for you? Let's say you buy probably $10 million. How much you would put down? How much you would borrow? That's a really simple question that requires a complicated answer. Okay. <laughs> it depends on your own circumstances. Do you do you have the cash? The, if a tenant was to vacate, do you have the the, the financial resources to to uh, manage the, the the gap? Right. I mean, it depends on a lot. It depends on well, three your months, yeah, or six months, or three months. You know, and if you're looking for the right tenant, might maybe longer. Yeah. And uh, if you're as finicky as I am, I'm happy to keep my building, my my space empty, no problem. Uh, why? So I'm interested in the right tenant. Tenant. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so all depends on how much cash return, but you need to know basically your investment strategy before you would exactly and model. And Dan, I'll, I'll share a quick story. I was moderating a REIT panel, yep. and I was invited to uh, because of, you know the returns we've been yeah. fortunate enough to produce. Share before. with us the return because it's amazing. I know you've done your calculation. Oh, I know the numbers, but you share the numbers. It's crazy. Uh, it's almost unbelievable. In fact, yeah. you know, since 2006, we've been generating 45% a year. 45% a year. Well, not, not 4.5, 45% a year. That's amazing. On a relatively low risk basis. Yeah, that's, well. that, that's incredible return. That's unheard of. Well, I knew that I would get a lot, a lot of eyebrows raised. So, yeah, like, yeah I want to feel skeptical too. Like, we like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I knew I was doing really, really well. And uh, did, but I didn't know how well. Mm. So at year number ten, and at the end of 2015, I hired a pretty respected audit firm. Mm. I hired some appraisers, mm. and I said, "Listen, could you look at the numbers? Could, yeah. could you give me an independent report?" Mm. And what came back was, "Oh my goodness, my eyes just popped out." I mean, it was that I had an annualized return of 33 percent for 10 years. Yes. And uh, and I waited a couple three years. I looked at my my portfolio again, and, and yes. what came back was, I mean, I'd walloped. Uh, and just to put things in context, uh, that return is five times better than the the average North American rate in the oh, district. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just you know. so so from from there, and so now you've just performed all of this real estate. And when did you decide to go into different sectors? Because I know you also own shares in, in two public companies in tech, right? Correct. And so how did you transition to that? And what's your business model today? Well, I've always been a, an investor. Mm. And um, you, you might recall, I mentioned to you, I was looking for some, some uh, risk adjusted rewards that were better than average. So I never stopped really investing in, in technology companies and, and technology related assets. Mm. And so, two of my favorite companies, the first one is just, in my viewpoint, uh, transformational. And because I, I'm look, looking at it from a real estate set, from a real estate hat on, what, we, this, what this company has developed is the world's world's first transparent electricity generating window. Wow. Yeah. Company's called Solar Window. Yes. It's public. Yes. Solarwindow.com yes. for anybody wants information. So let me see if I get this right. So with Windows it generates electricity because of sun? Correct. So what we in fact 
So it's not solar panel. We're not just talking about solar panel. No, and listen, I, I own assets in the United States. I own assets in one of the sunniest places in the U.S., yes. Scottsdale, Arizona. Yes. And one day I looked around and I said, hey, where, where are all the solar panels? In fact, I told my staff, hey, could you do it? I'd like to put some solar panels up. And the numbers I came back, the economics made no sense whatsoever. Because it costs too much. It costs too much. Absent subsidies and this time, yeah, it doesn't work. So a decade ago, I was waiting for a meeting at the University of Illinois, the same place where, the, where the, one of the founders of YouTube went. Oh, nice. Yeah, I know nice. you're yes. a big yes. YouTube, yes. Uh, a highly regarded yes. uh, individual. And uh, this crazy idea came to me. You know, the idea was to create a transparent electricity generating window. Wow. So we've been at it for a decade. Uh, personally, I put 30 million US dollars into this. So mm -hmm. and my money is where my mouth is, right? Yes. And uh, for the first five years, we failed, 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 yeah. failed, failed. And slowly we made it. Was it because too new of a concept? Well, when you're trying to do something that's never been done before, yeah, you know, forget it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the tech, listen, we had to make technology, develop certain technology. Right. 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 And then, then all of a sudden, we started making progress. We started setting records. Uh, we started winning awards. Mm -hmm. We presented to members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, lo and behold, today, uh, so what we have, just so you know, what we have is a liquid coating. Oh. It's a tr transparent liquid electricity generating coating that gets sprayed onto a piece of glass. Okay. So what happens to that glass? A passive glass becomes now electricity generating. Right. You fabricate that into a window, you put it onto a building, guess what happens? You have a vertical power generator. Wow. So how does that get translated to, to get electricity? Like from, so you have the coating and then... The coatings in the window yes. grab the electrons from yes. the sun, yes. run over the wires and into the building. So, okay, this is incredible. So let's say if you have a commercial, like an office building, which is all glass and all windows. Let's say if they use this, the whole building becomes a massive solar panel. Is that a concept? We are working with some independent labs, yes. uh, government funded US labs. And that's where our R&D has taken place. Yes. We produce a little module. Yes. And that module generated a certain amount of energy. Mm. They sent that module to another party yeah. at the University of North Carolina, yeah. where a very highly regarded engineering yeah. group yeah. Uh, did some calculations. Right. And what they modeled was, they said, if you were to take this module, make it into a window, yeah. and clad it onto a 50-story tower in New York City, a yeah. midtown tower, yeah. and derate it for shade, reflection, yeah, yeah. so on and so on. How much it? Well, according to the independent modeling, yeah. the amount of energy generated by that one uh, building would offset its power needs by 50%. Oh, wow. Yeah. And on our website, solarwinder.com, we have a uh, press release that talks about that. That's crazy. Listen, listen, in the U.S., I don't know what the numbers are for Canada. Yeah. In the U.S., commercial buildings consume $150 billion worth of energy. Yes, yeah, huge. It's huge, right? Huge. And that's about 40% of all the energy that's produced. Yeah. So imagine if these windows were able to reduce by 5%, 10% of the environment. And, yeah, so, and, and, and the other company that I have is, is equally as exciting. Now, on the one hand, you know, we're, we're helping uh, uh, industry in terms of reducing costs and so on. This other technology is a company called, uh, made by a company called Renova Care. Renova Care, yes. And so it's also a public company. Also public. Yeah. And Renova Care is something that I'm so thrilled about, so excited about, because the potential uh, is um, goes beyond um, technological breakthroughs. It, go, it goes to maybe potentially saving people's lives. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a little machine that looks like the Starship Enterprise, okay. handheld, battery powered. Okay. If you're a burn victim, uh, the doctors would take a little piece of your skin, pop it into a, a, a vial. 90 minutes later, your stem cells are sprayed back on you. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about Anthony Robbins earlier in his book, Money Master of the yeah, Game. Yeah. He just rips apart Wall Street for the first 300 pages, right? Yeah, yeah. basically. <laughs> he wrote it. Yeah. And then the next 100 pages, he talks about breakthrough technologies and things that could change the world. Yeah. The first technology he talks about is this one, a skin gun. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's incredible. So, so any burn victim. So before, I guess, with, with burn victim, where they might need to take other pieces. Let's say if I have a burning hand, I might need to get my inner thigh to the skin to... It's called skin grafting. Yeah, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, what we want to do is make skin grafting obsolete. That's our goal. And we want to do it with a gentle spray of your own skin cells. So how does a machine work? Um, essentially, we take a little yep. inch by inch yep. piece of your skin. Yep. It goes into a liquid solution. There's enzymes and this and that and the other yep. in there. And 90 minutes later, the most regenerative skin cells are liberated. And those are the ones that are sprayed back on you. Let me give you a little science lesson yes. here. Yeah, I love so, it. I love it. so when you're when you have a cut and you have a burn, yes. the cells grow in from the edges, right? Right. That's the skin cells growing towards each other. Yeah. What we do is we spray a whole bunch of cells onto that wound. Yes. And all of a sudden now skin cells are growing everywhere. So it, ah, that's how it works. Wow. It the the inventor of this technology uh, in Germany. Yes. And he has uh, gosh, he has uh, two PhDs. Uh, an MD, experimental surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. He's 150 published papers, and this guy's a genius. Mm -hmm. They were trying to grow skin mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a bioreactor. Mm -hmm. Just as you're talking about, you know, yeah. instead of the skin graft, you put yeah. the skin in. Yeah. Failed, 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 failed. And one day they had an aha moment. Oh, you know, the best bioreactor ever created is, is, is a body. Yeah. So they then went to work of, of finding a way to, to put skin cells down on the burn. Mm -hmm. And the local is a local burn center, that's a burn center. And the head surgeon said, you know what, I'd like to try the skin gun against skin grafting, the gold standard, mm -hmm. then and now, by the way. Yes. And they were going to do a 19 patient study. And uh, after patient number three, the doctor and the head of the burn center decided he's not going to use, use uh, grafting anymore. He's just going to go ahead and finish it with, with, with the skin gun. Wow. It's amazing. It's, it's an amazing. Oh, both, both companies, like to me, those are very like, revolutionary like industry disrupt disruptions. Dan, that's why I've been supporting them for so long. They, there's, and by the way, for the longest time, uh, everybody thought they were far-fetched, too much of a blue sky, yeah. oh, this, that can't be true. Yeah. And I know I'd so it support. So this is why you know, I'm so vested in it. Yes. Um, um, uh, and I, I, it makes sense to me because I can see you have the real estate, which is very tangible, it's tenant, it's a building, it's brick, right? Brick and mortar. And then on the other hand, these concepts, it might seem far-fetched, but I think from an investment point of view, but also from a personal passion point of view, it's something that you could support that you know will make huge difference to the environment, to patients, right? And it might feel like it doesn't fit in the portfolio. I think it fits very well in the portfolio. Dan, it fits very well because it, 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 it's in line with my philosophy. The more you give, the more you get. Yes. If you're a good person, if you do good things, yes. good things happen. It makes a lot of sense. So for someone, let's say if they, if they say they've got a, a decent business, entrepreneur, I believe a lot of entrepreneurs, they are actually, they, they have high income but underinvested, right? They're very good at making money. They, they hustle, they get customers. They, Close deals, they always go, 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 go. But a lot of them, where when they get to a little bit older, they realize, hey, actually, I've got a company that's making a lot of money, but I don't, I don't have any investments. What's your advice for them? Like, how does, she, how does she, how should they get started? How should they get into it? How do they take some of the earnings that they have? How much they should take it, put into investments? Like, what's your take? Gosh, you know, I stopped giving investment advice 30 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so when I left the bridge, yes. was, that was yes. it. I mean, look, I'm, but now you're the perfect time to give investment advice, right? You're not stockbroker anymore, right? Uh, well, listen, I, I guess um, what I, if, if it were me, I would obviously, uh, you know, I would rush to get into real estate. I really would. Ha mm. Had I known now what I, uh, what I know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about? I, I would have been in real estate 30 years ago. Okay. I mean, there's no better wealth creating asset class than real estate. Got it. And I think I heard you say, and I think it's a horror T Ecker quote, yeah. you know, don't wait to buy real estate. Yeah, buy real estate. And wait. I love that. And, 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 and as long as you follow the parameters, you know, don't be buying real estate in the middle of nowhere and uh, where nobody wants to be. Yeah. So that, that doesn't work. Yeah. And, and also, you know what? Um, you know, the, the, the fellow that hired me so many years ago, the only one that would hire me, uh, in one of our conversations, he says, Harmel, you know, all these big blue chip guys, you know, they look down on me, look mm -hmm. down on us, mm -hmm. us being uh, that, that uh, mid-tier mid mid yeah. brokerage community that supports early stage companies, yeah. uh, small caps, yeah. right? And he said, but you know what? I buy a brand new Rolls Royce every year, every other year. And these guys, uh, you know, they barely make three, four, five, six percent, you know, pushing their bonds and blue chip stocks. Yeah. 
And that really resonated with me. And then, you know, as I look back, the, the, the big returns, the gargantuan returns, yes. life-changing, wealth-building, yeah. are made in small companies that become big companies. Yeah. And uh, Bill, uh, uh, one of my tenants, uh, it's a local unicorn. Mm. You never hear about them because the management team is so humble, so wonderful. Mm. They went from barely paying their rent mm. to running a Google ad. A big company answers it, and I think it cost them two dollars for the Google ad. <laughs> that's a that's a good return right there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and next thing you know, they will go from in my building from forty five hundred feet to ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand. Offices in Chicago, New York, Singapore, London. Yeah. Their London office has a massive uh, patio overlooking the tents. I mean, we're talking an insane. But it came from an idea. Mm. So, you know, I, I've always believed in, in my portfolio, I use the, the, the barbell approach. And I used to keep a lot of cash, and I still do, because the, that cash, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. If you have cash, guess what? You're going to attract more cash. Yeah. Right? I, I totally believe in that. That's Agreed. awesome. Yeah. And, and I believe that's also an insurance policy. And the only reason why I... I, I don't believe in that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I moved a bit of my cash into real estate. When I started, I, I collateralized my, my real estate company with 24 million Canadian, 20 million American. And I didn't want to take too much more risk than a bank deposit. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And, but on the other side of my barbell are these crazy ideas. Mm. And my, my theory was if you know blend it, I mean, you'd get a great return. You average it out, right? Yeah, I had no idea I was gonna produce almost you know 45 percent a year for a long time. Yes. Yeah, right? Yes. And but it's it's um, that's my philosophy. That's that's what I do. So if somebody else wants to follow, great. I'm, you can't guarantee they'll do the same thing as I. Or mm. if I follow your footsteps, I can't. You know because we're all different. Your personality is mm. is, is yes. And, and do you know with your with your family office, do you take on investors or you just manage your own portfolio? You no, know, we don't take any outside capital on. And in relative terms, we're a very modest family office. I mean, there are offices out there that are yeah. billions. We're, we're small fries right. in, the, in the scheme of things. And we are the quintessential family office. And literally, when I make my investments, if it's any more than $10 million, I literally have a family meeting <laughs> at a table and I ask permission. Yes. So we're... We're that way. We're I got way. it. I got it. So, so for <laughs> entrepreneurs, they need to get into real estate early, put some money aside, and also I think not gambling everything into the business. That's I think one thing that I that I've learned. Where because business goes through ups and downs too. Like if it works one day, if you don't take money out, and, and of course we want to we invest it back in the business. But I think there's there's that fine balance. Sure. Right. Uh, so for someone like that, so what about for young young guys, like maybe they're early 20s, millennials, what advice would you have for them? If they want to create wealth. And they have nothing, they come from nothing. They come from nothing. Well, you know, the, again, I go back to, to uh, real estate. You know, by the way, you know the Empire State Building mm. uh, was bought by uh, Mr. Hensley with very little of his own money. Mm. Put together a partnership, had 3,000 some odd investors, they raised uh, 30 odd million, put a six million dollar mortgage. And they own an iconic building in New York City. It's crazy. Today it's worth $2 billion. Yeah. So these young guys, the millennials, if they don't have any money, I write about this in my book. Yeah. You know, well, how do you, make, how do you invest if you don't have any money? Well, I'll show you how. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you get a team of people together, four or five, ten people, and buy an asset. And what I would do is I wouldn't put any debt on it. Mm. Because I didn't get a chance to finish That's my story. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to finish my story earlier when I was <coughs> moderating that REIT panel. Um, there's four or five hundred people in the audience, and one of them asked a question of, of one of the guys, and uh, uh, that, as it turned out, that REIT does not have any debt. Oh. I said, why do you, I went back to him, and why do you, why don't you have any debt? Yeah. He says, well, I'm, we would rather make that money ourselves and give it to the banks. I said, huh, that explains why banks report record profits quarter after quarter after quarter, because <laughs> the... Lending money is very lucrative. Yeah, 100%. Some of the biggest fortunes in history made from lending yeah, money, money yeah. right? And I went back, I looked at my, 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 my portfolio of buildings, both here in the United States, and uh, I'm like, oh my goodness, the banks are making more money than I am. Mm. I'm making interest payments. Yeah. And you're managing the, the I'm property. Yeah. And, and, and if something should go wrong, guess what? They're going to grab my asset. Uh, yes. It's crazy. Yes. So if I were starting out, I would put a group of friends together. So you buy all cash? Buy all cash. Okay. It's a ten million dollar. Let's say have a ten million dollar property. Get 
whatever, 10 people, 20 people, chipped in, like half a million each, boom, you do the deal, and then you get a piece of that and you just, you're the one who's going to it, right? What is wrong with getting, and, and, and if you want to put a little, little leverage it's not like it. And I, and I give an example in the book uh, of, uh, of a six, seven cap property. Mm. You've got a bit of debt on it, mm. and you can take that to 10, 12% yield with relatively low risk. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with a 10%? And if you compare that to the markets, historically, what has been the average return of the markets? Uh, 8%, 9%, yeah, 7%? Exactly. All day long, with the eyes closed, you can get 10% in real estate on a relatively low risk basis. Mm. All day long. Mm. And you don't have to worry about. So, in terms of your your portfolio right now, uh, how much you, see, you talk about? You like the cash? What's a good ratio in terms of like cash versus investment? How, how much cash do <clears> you <throat> always have in the, in the big scheme of things, percentage ones? Well, it varies for everybody, right? I mean, uh, just for your own, like from your perspective, what what what, what are you comfortable with? I'm, I usually like to have at least 10, 20% cash. Okay, so sit there. You, you, you got to for a rainy day. You never, you never know. You never know. And, right. and, and uh, you know, we talked about timing yeah. earlier on. There may be sometimes. Uh, when, when the market crashed here locally, a local investor, you know his name, bought a prominent building on West Georgia. Oh. He bought it for like 80 million because he had the cash. Uh -huh. Six months later, it's so worth 120. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. cash is king. Yes. And so you need the that. 10, 20%. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I have less, sometimes I have more. Sometimes, you know, a deal. sometimes I have nothing. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm, you know, it just varies. Uh, depends. And then depends the, 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 the investments you have, what's, so you, you want to, you don't want to have a lot. There's some you have debt, but some you probably don't, some don't have debt. So it's your you know, strategy where it's more long term, you buy, hold. We finance, take that money, and reinvest. Yeah, that's one of the ways we've been doing it. What I like to do long term, though, is I want to follow up in the footsteps of that REIT. It's also a like building on Granville Street owned by an old family. They own a portfolio of buildings, and uh, they have no debt, and all the cash flow just, just, you know, they put into charitable uh, functions. But I love that idea. I love not having to be beholden to a bank. Yeah. Especially in the United States, you know, some of these we mistakenly. Uh, Talk about this. Yeah, mm. we, we mistakenly took on some CMBS debt that has some onerous restrictions and, and clauses. And clauses and it's crazy. I mean, these yeah. bankers. They, well, you read, by the way, you read any of these deals you sign with the bank. The bank controls the deal. They own your building. Well, well, it, it's not your building. It's the bank's it's building. The bank's building. Until you, the yeah, you take the money, you, you really have to think. They, there's, there's always a clause somewhere that you know, they can call a loan, they can do this, they can, they can do a lot, of, a lot of shit to you. Seriously. And then they have to because you know what? What are they doing? They're not, they're not protecting themselves. Oh, they're no, protecting yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 not the bank, they protect themselves. Yeah. They're bankers. It's not their money. They're lending on somebody else's cash. Yeah. So guys like you and I and other people that you and I yeah. may know that are entrepreneurial that have liquid resources, you know what, yeah. like they don't look at things as a banker because it's not his money. No, it's money. So. It, they're using other people's money to buy something that is not theirs. It just, that's how they make money in between, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. So talk to me a little bit about this book. What inspired you to write this book? Uh, again, earlier we talked about uh, my philosophy of, of, you know, being a good person when you're, when you're uh, good always be good. I always like to ask, how long it took you to write this? Oh, it took me way, way <laughs> longer. Than, it took me like six months and it took me way longer. It's not, I thought it was going to be a breeze. <laughs> Damn, it's kidding. not, it's not, it's not. <laughs> and then the worst part is the bloody editing. Oh, yes. And yes. I'm ashamed to admit that we, uh, after a number of uh, you know reviews, yeah. we still found mistakes. <laughs> oh, yes, that's true, that's true. I don't know. A book. It's the same thing. Every time I finish a book, I, I promise myself, I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to write another book. Right. Well, and then be before you know it, you write another book. Well, that, this will make it awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, again, you, you get what you give, and so this is kind of like your your, your masterpiece. This is this is what you want to share with people: your, your story, your lessons. And so many people have helped me. I've been broke three times. Yeah, and I would not have gotten back up on my feet had it not been for the support of all those around me. Yeah. So many people have opened their minds. Their experiences, their lives to me. Yeah. From the very first guy back in 1982 yeah. that so, invited me to New York City. And let me tell you, that was an expensive trip for a young kid. Yes. <laughs> I think I put on the credit card. Yes. I mean, all these experiences have allowed me to, to enjoy um, a good lifestyle. And, and I'm, you know, I guess this is one of my ways of giving back. Yes. And, uh, and I'm sure you have a lot of people that come to you and say, How did you do it? 
now you can have something like you can. It's all like, written on the right, like read the day yeah. book. <laughs> and Dan, I can tell you, uh, for a while, people did come and yeah. say, "Hey, I don't know, you know, could you give me a little guidance, give a little advice?" Yeah. And uh, I had put together my, as my, I call it my success formula. It's yes. an acronym for for things that you've got to be mindful of. Yes. So every time I went, went broke, oh, that hurt. What did I do wrong? Like, I'm right there. Mm. Uh, oh, I made that mistake. Gosh, that hurt. What did I do wrong? Yes. So I wrote all my things down. And over the years, my, my success formula yes. has, has transformed. Yes. So this is the latest iteration is in this book. And I love it. And uh, success, the first S, uh, I'll, I'll give you just a yes. couple of yes, pointers. Please. Please. First S is critical. You know, if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm. The first S is a sense of direction. You have to have a goal. Mm. You know, when a pilot, even before the pilot fires up his jet. Sense of direction. Yeah, you need to know where you're going, mm. right? And you need to write it down. Mm. I think I learned this from one of your, your uh, talks. I think mm. less than what, three, two percent of people write their goals down. They don't. They don't write their goals down. And they don't write it down regularly. They, uh, they might write it once and put it away. Only 1% reads their goals every single day. Yeah. 1%. Yeah. And... Um, you know, success, yes, and sense of direction. The U stands for understanding. You've got to figure out how you're going to get there. You know, how you, you've got to learn. How the business works, how it works, exactly. how the world works. Whether it's to listen to you at one of your seminars, mm -hmm. read your books, uh, whether it's to listen to one of your YouTube oh, videos. Mentor, yes. Mentors, you uh, hire people, mm -hmm. you have to have an understanding. And I can go on and on and on. You, you know, there's one, it's S-U-C-C. -C. The second C, uh, is a um, is a is a uh, a trait that will, according to uh, Warren Buffett, increase your worth by fifty percent. It's communication skills. Yes. Got, and by the way, you your C is very big. I can tell you. That. <laughs> well, I, I tell people communication equals wealth. Yes. It's very very true. Like think about back then, a poor immigrant boy couldn't speak a word of English, right? Like it's my second language, and I took you could say would be my disadvantage into my strongest strength that I could communicate and articulate ideas and share with the world. Just that extreme, like I took what's the weakest trait that I have, I took it as the strongest, and I 100% communication skill. I'll tell you why you've done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, right? Anyways, I go into a lot of detail, and I've been, I've been sharing this, this, this formula of mm -hmm. sorts with all these individuals that would come to me, and one of, one of them, my you know, I know you have many mentees. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. yes. I, I only have a few. One of the guys that came to me was in the whole 200,000. Wow. I'm just distraught. And I said, look, you've got to follow this formula. Next thing I know, he's making a lot of money and back on his feet. Next thing you know, well, that's, that's a the fundamental, right? That's a fancy new, that's a nice car. Yes. That's a million dollars a metal in his driver. lives in a $20 million house. Nice, nice, and, nice. And he credits the formula. Yes. And, and it's, you know, it's like the law of gravity, right? If, you, if, you, if I drop this cup here, mm -hmm. it's going to go down. If I drop it in Hong Kong, it's going to go down. Mm. If I make a cake here, if I follow a formula, it's going to be a good cake. Yes, if I follow the same formula in London, yes. it'd be good cake. So that's a creator recipe that's worked for me. Yes. And I hope it'll work for others too. I, I love it. I love it. And what's the best way to get a copy of the book? Well, Amazon is one, or, you know, uh, uh, we can always, uh, uh, if they come to my website, we can always get a free download, no yes. problem. Uh, uh, we're here to share the. Share the wealth of knowledge. It's awesome. And, and I think for anyone, it's not just you're thinking about investing. I believe it doesn't matter. Entrepreneur, you're getting started. You got to learn how money works. You have to learn how to money. Like money moves to people who understands it, who, who, who cherishes, who studies it, right? That's not part in school. And that's part of my passions where I do a lot of sharing on social media because, as you know, the school system is not teaching people. Dan, the problem with the right? school system is the teachers, how can they teach about money if they don't know themselves? Just like the hypocrite, we're talking about like <sighs> stockbroker, teaching better buy stocks, they don't buy stocks. It's like taking swimming lessons from somebody who can't swim. Can't That's swim. the problem. Yeah. So, anyways, it's really uh, I totally agree. I totally agree. So, I, I absolutely love it. Make sure you get a copy. Thank you so much for being here. My I love pleasure. It. We, we could talk for hours. I'm learning. I want to learn more. <laughs> we'll go for dinner. I, I will do for dinner. I, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Perfect. Make sure you get a copy of the book. And make sure you also give us a review. If you enjoy our show on podcast, listening to this, The Dan Lok Show, give us a review. And maybe share with me some of your favorite guests that we've interviewed in the past. And maybe some future guests that you want me to bring on the show as well. So stay tuned. I'll talk to you next time.